Those with seeing eyes and hearing ears are the first ones to see the new thing God's about to do. Not everybody in the body of Christ has positioned themselves so that they can see with their spiritual eyes and hear with their spiritual ears. So they've got to see someone else be the trendsetter. They'll tend to fight the new thing that God's doing. Some will even get mad and leave the church. But after a certain amount of time, however much time it takes for your seed to grow, you'll come back. The things I preached in the 80s, other churches in my hometown preached against. In the 90s, they were preaching what I was preaching. And I was probably preaching what someone else was preaching in the 70s. So Cornelius saw something, and he didn't have a Bible to get it out of, or a television program to listen to the preacher to get it out of. He saw it on his own as the Holy Ghost. I'm convinced that the eyes of the Lord are searching all over the earth. Whether you've got a TV or you go to church or you have a Bible or not. And he can impart revelation knowledge in you. And you just know that you know that you know. You might not be able to doctrinally explain it. But you know it. And you step out and you act on it. And fruit is born. Remember when you were first saved? You go to the street corners and witness to people. And you tell them things you never heard said before. You say, my God, am I lying to them? And the preacher would preach it on Sunday morning. You say, "Woo, that must have been the Holy Ghost. That happened to anybody else besides me? So his alms and his prayers went up as a memorial and caused God to move. And three years before, the man that was raised to, to preach to the Gentiles, because he had to fight the religious battle to get the Jewish church to accept it, Cornelius had a miracle, his giving. We've been taught so much wrong teaching about money. Greedy preachers have preached erroneous teaching about money. How many of the drunk drivers kill thousands of people with cars every year? Do you get rid of your car? It's not the car. It's the drunk driver. There are people that are drunk with greed and lusting after mammon, and they're going to try and manipulate you. When God called me in the ministry, I said, Lord, you know, they tell me that you're really smart, but <laughs> I'm not a minister. And then he said, I went off fasting and prayer. I want you to start a church. You want me to be a pastor? I mean, in my mind, I didn't say it to him. You've lost your mind. I don't even like people. And you want me to pastor? <laughs> well, I was being honest. Try it. I, I like people now. I like people now. Love people now. He needed me or someone like me. I was probably, I think, you know, I, I never tell these stories. I was telling Pastor this week. I never tell these stories. So I'm writing this book, so I'm going back and trying to recall these stories. It amazes me. I want to be that person, whoever that was. But it amazes me. I, I think I was the third person he asked to start the church. The pastor in front of me was the second, and he couldn't do it because I told you why. He decided he was, and he left the ministry. Because I didn't know anything about religion. I didn't know anything about the Bible. So I didn't know I couldn't do what the Bible told me I could do. If I read it in the Bible, then I just said, I can have that. If I read it in the Bible, I was so illiterate. The first Bible that I bought, I, had, I went to Kmart to buy it. This was in 1972. That's how smart I was. I went to Kmart to buy a Bible. And I was so illiterate, the Bible I got brought to church. Every time they said, open your book to the book of John, I couldn't find it. Every time they hit the book of Acts, I couldn't find it. Ephesians, I couldn't find it. After about a month or six weeks of doing this, the girl sitting next to me said, give me that thing. There was no Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John in my Bible that came from Kmart. The printers had made a mistake. They had half of the Old Testament repeated three times. And I didn't know it. Church should be over an hour and a half. I'm still looking for Mark and Matthew. It's in here somewhere. I had to be told. I'm just pointing out how illiterate I was, how ignorant I was of the things of God. But it's a, it's a blessing because I didn't have to unlearn some of what you've had to unlearn, some of what you are still struggling to unlearn. 
Romans 10 says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Galatians 5, Paul says, what, who has bewitched you? You used to be on fire for God. You used to be excited. Let me ask you, what put that spell on you? When you, when you received the spirit, did you receive it through obeying religion or through the hearing of faith? Verse 5 in Galatians 3, he that worketh miracles among you, that energizes the dunamis, energia the dunamis, the, the realm of the miraculous among you, does he do it by you doing religious things or by the hearing of faith? The echoic pistis, by the receiving the words of the message. This is what I'm convinced. I'm convinced of this. When you hear the word, not just the physical act of hearing, but you receive the content of the message. You receive the word, literally the words of the message. Faith is going to be produced. I'm convinced faith is produced every time. You have to be talked out of it. You have to be talked out of acting. And you're usually the one that talks yourself out of it. Talk about physical he uh, hearing. How many of you have to try to hear? Huh? How many have to go... Hearing is automatic. You can't stop it. I broke it apart. I don't have my notes here, so I can't tell you, but there's about five or seven different processes you go through things that begin to get to that nerve that causes the hearing. It's automatic. You cannot stop hearing. I believe faith is automatic. Why do more miracles happen in impoverished nations than they do in America? Because they don't know enough religion to stop it. So I approached the Word of God this way because I didn't know any better. If I read it, I believed it. Now it's up to me. It's not up to me to prove that it's true or to theologically give me a basis to believe it. I just believed it. Now I'm trying to get what the Word says I can have in my life. I'm trying to receive it. I'm trying to walk in it. So it's a whole different perspective of looking at the Word of God and living your life. We started in our living room with seven people, like, like the pastor told you, or with seven people. And we were there about six months and rented a storefront. And then it was time, God told me it's time to build a building. And so we had the plan, found the land. There's all kinds of stories in between that, and I'll skip all of that. But I went to the bank. That's what you do. This was not, would have been 1978, I think, somewhere around in there. Well, no, it would have been like 1976. And interest rates, if you remember, Jimmy Carter was president and were on their way to eventually become 21%, gas lines and so on. Wasn't a good time to go borrow money. But I didn't know anything about banking. I didn't know anything about money. I was a rock and roll musician that God saved. I was a long-haired, dope-smoking hippie. I didn't know anything about anything, which is a good place to be. <laughs> so the bank banker who ended up being a neighbor of mine a few years later Turned me down. He said, Perry, what you'll have to do, we had about 125 people. He said, what you have to do is go get five or so men that are members and let them come in and put up their houses for collateral. We'll give you the money. I think we needed, I don't remember how much it was, something like 400000 500000 Well, I didn't know what to do, but I knew I didn't want to do that. Because <laughs> I'd already seen a church where the, the guys with the money ran the board. And all of our excitement and the anointing and the Holy Ghost moving, and they voted no, 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 no on everything. That's why I was at least number three to do what I was doing. And the pastor before me was number two. He would not stand up to the board. And, and I just saw the glory of God coming in and miracles, and we're trying to move on. And they kept saying no, 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 no. So I knew not to do that. So I went back to my car, and I'm not ashamed to tell you, I put my head on the steering wheel, and I started crying. Not like a little baby, but like I let you down, God. I let you down. I am not man enough to do, to get a loan from the bank. I let you down. I failed you. I'm so sorry. My heart was broken. The one that has loved me more than anyone in my whole life, I just let down. The one that looked past all of my failures and all my sins, and they were horrible, and all my ugly things. The one that said, I love you, I love you, and pulled me and just wiped my slate clean, just wiped it clean. And he said, come unto me like a new creation, a new species of being. The one that gave me a chance when no one else would, I failed him. And my heart was broken. I let you down, I'm sorry. And I heard the Spirit say in my inner man, I never told you to go to the bank. <laughs> it's 
So I said, what? <laughs> he said, Perry, I never told you to go to the bank. Well, then how do I do this? This is 1976. He said, let me show you. I'm convinced those of us that know the word of God and have been doing this for some time, not novices, but those that are grounded in the word, the reason we don't see the things we want to see is we don't give him a chance. We did just what I did. What I thought everyone else in the world does, I got to do. And sometimes we'll, God will lead you to do it that way. But the operative word is, is God leading you to do it that way? When the famine came and the drought came, Abraham went to Egypt and he saved his life and he came back rich. When the drought came in the next generation, Isaac was on his way to Egypt and, and got, because Egypt had the Nile. It didn't matter if it rained or not. They had the Nile and there was always grain and food. And, and God said, don't go to Egypt like your father. But my father did it. That's the way my father raised me. That's the religion I've been taught. That's what my pastor tells, has told me to do for 20 or 40 years. And God says, that's not what I want you to do. I'm not talking about this. In fact, I'm going to talk about 28 different subjects this morning. I got a feeling. But the first thing that Abraham had to do in order to receive the blessing was to leave his father's house. You've got to leave your old way of thinking or you'll never grab a hold of the new thing God's fixing to do. If you want to keep having what they had, and, and nothing wrong with what they had, because in their time, they were on the cutting edge. But I'm telling you, what God's about to do is going to blow your mind beyond your wildest imagination, beyond your wildest dream. And we need to get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready, get our minds in a mindset. We need a, a, a paradigm shift of our thinking and our speaking to be able to do what it is that God's about to do. So Abram had to leave. In order to gain. So I have to be willing. And so God, I said, what do I do? He said, let me show you. And so he, sh he showed me where the children of Israel, you know, were a total of 440 years, 400, 400 years as slaves in Egypt. Thank you very much. That's a blessing. You make my heart feel good. And after 400 years as slaves. Now, this, is, this speaks to me because I was a drug addict. And I was a slave to all that comes with being a rock and roll musician. And in order for me to get saved, I had to lose every single friend I had. Because if I would have kept one, I would have stayed in that stuff. Because I'm weak. My flesh is weak. So when my spirit gets strong, then the flesh shuts up. So with a slave's mentality, 400 years generation after generation they're fixing to come out and what does God do I'm going to give you favor on the people that say they own you and they took the gold and the silver they really they took everything that was needed to build the tabernacle in the wilderness did you catch the connection I'm fixing to build the church building it's not the tabernacle in the wilderness, but it's the place where the presence of God is going to come and God's people are going to come. And, and, and I saw slaves had everything they needed in the wilderness where you couldn't go to Hobby Lobby or, or whatever the lumber yard is around here. You couldn't go to lumber yards. They had everything that was needed to build this golden palace in the wilderness. And it came from the place where they were enslaved, and it came through a supernatural miracle God had done. And so I said, well, but again, remember, remember, I buy my Bibles from Kmart. <laughs> if he could do that for them, that put faith inside of my heart. And so I stepped out, and I told the people, I said, this is what we're going to do. And so we started, and 27 building projects later, and eventually moved to 80 acres and a huge auditorium and, and TV studio, and you name it, we had it. 80 acres of land. We were debt-free the whole, whole time, whole, whole 30 years that I was there. And, and this started in 1976. The only one I knew doing it then was John Osteen. I remember I was listening to a preacher by the name of Albert Willis. I remember what year it was. It was probably it was around 78 or 79, I think. 
And it, but it was in October. I was a salesman on the road. And so part of where I went was to go to Lafayette, Louisiana. And he had a, had a thing going on, so I went and spent an hour there. And, and, and he was teaching about being debt-free. And I saw it in the Word of God. Deuteronomy 28. This is the blessing of the Lord. It really is the Barakah, if you read it in the Hebrew. It's, it's Abraham's blessing that you, you, you will lend and not borrow. Everything you put your hand to will prosper. You'll be blessed coming in. You'll be blessed going out. You'll be blessed in the fruit of your body. You'll be blessed in everything in, in your life. And I think it's verse 8 or something. God says, I'll command the Barakah on your storehouses. Well, that's your checking account and your money market and your savings account. And, and, and he said, you can be debt free. And I grabbed it. You see, faith comes by hearing. It's automatic. I didn't talk myself out of it. I didn't go second guessing, second thoughting. I didn't say, well, that's never happened to me. I've never seen anything like that happen to me. My God, I've never seen anything like that happen ever. Well, now we know why it's never happened to you. Because that's all you're saying. Now, I'm not here to take up an offering. I don't need the offering. Because God has made us. We've got enough to last the rest of our life. But you know why he gave it to us? Because we've given five times that much away. He gives so that you can be a giver, so that you can bless it. So I believe to pay off cars. It took me six months, but in April I walked into Calcasieu Marine National Bank on Enterprise Boulevard, and I said, I've come to pay off both my car loans. And the little uh, woman behind the, uh, the, the counter said, you can't do that. <laughs> Did you hear what the Babylonian system tell me? <laughs> the Babylonian system of money doesn't want you doing this. She said, you can't do that. I said, well, I guess I can. She said, well, I've never seen that happen before. I said, well, you fixing to see it today. <laughs> and since then, we've bought cars and paid off cars because I broke through that. Amen. I didn't break through it. God broke through it before creation. I just stumbled along with my Bible from Kmart. <laughs> And, and I found that God kept giving me these little faith projects. It started with a $225 used IBM Selected typewriter. And then I wanted to buy a PA system for, for, our, for our, our, our new church that had started. And then, I wanted, and then it grew to pay off the cars. And then I'm paying off the house. And, then I'm, and it's just growing and growing. Next thing you know, I'm believing for millions of dollars of buildings and not taking up offerings and not begging anybody and not doing some sort of giving drive thing where you make a pledge and then I hound you for the rest of your life. <laughs> I didn't do any of that. Did over 2,000 TV programs. It's not I. It's all God. It's all the Holy Ghost. But didn't do, take up any money in any of the TV programs. Because that's, preachers have this stigma on them that people say that they're yada, yada, yada. Well, I'm not yada, yada, yada. Amen. And neither should you be. I'm here to tell you there is a better way. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 19. Paul prays. It's a holy, long, many verses of prayer. And he says, I pray that you know the love of Christ so you can be filled with all the fullness of God. So you can be filled with the full measure of God. How many want to be filled with the full measure of God? I mean, you want all there is of God. Well, you've got to know the love of Christ is the first step before that. The word know in the Greek is the Greek word genosko, genosko. There are many different words for know. This Greek scholar named Spiros Zodihetis defines genosko as to know experientially. Tay's translation says that you might experience this love for yourself. There's two types of knowledge. There's knowledge that's based upon guessing. You've never seen it, you've never experienced it. But so you're just guessing and your intellect and the way you've been taught and whatever information you have, you say, this is the way this is going to work. This is the way this is going to work. And so many sermons of so many preachers are preaching you things they've never walked in themselves. They're guessing. But experiential knowledge is, I'm not guessing anymore. I've lived it. I've walked in it. You can't talk me out of it. The devil can't trick me around it in the name of Jesus to experience this love in its fullness. I mean, to open your heart and to allow someone to love you like he wants to love you is an awesome, awesome thing. Because the first thing you do when someone comes to hug you or shake your hand or love you is say, no, not me. No, 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 I'm not getting close. No, close up, close up, close up, close up, close up. 
the first thing most of us do when someone comes to bless us in a significant way is we take a step back, throw up our hands, and says, that's too much. I can't receive it. Am I telling you the truth? Most of you, when someone comes to bless you, you've never, maybe you've never had someone come to bless you in a big way. But when they come to give you some sort of great financial thing, you'll step back. You'll throw up your hands and you'll say, that's too much. I can't receive it. Listen to me. Equate that to letting God love you. When God comes to love you, what will you do? You'll take a step back, throw up your hands. I'm unworthy. I can't deserve it. I can't let you love me. Peter in Luke chapter 5, stealing my message. Don't feel bad. She stole my message about Acts 10. I've never heard anyone preach that. I told you that. I'm the one who It won't work. So Peter, he told you the whole story. I don't need to set it up. So he's out there by faith throwing the net in. The net becomes a problem because there's so much fish. And the net begins to tear. I think that was an angel that went zip. And I'll tell you why in a second. So he can't bring the net over the side of the boat now. So he's grabbing the fish by the handfuls and he's throwing the fish in the boat. And there's so much fish, there's more fish coming out of that net than should be in that net. I think the angel put the hole there because the real miracle was God kept making fish swim in that net. Lift your hand and say, he can do that for me too. He can do that for me too. Now. Yeah. So I went and studied what it, how much weight can a boat handle. So there's a formula. You go to this nautical society, there's a formula you can work. And you apply the numbers to that formula, you get an idea. We were in Israel, I don't know how many years ago. I don't remember what it was. 15, 20, I don't remember how many years. But they had just discovered a boat that they measured through carbon dating was, was around the, the Sea of Galilee during the time of Christ. It was in the northwest corner of the Sea of Galilee, buried in mud. There was a drought. Water went down there. It was. They excavated it, and you could see it. We, we were just this close to this, right? You could see it. It's just it's a special thing. So it's 27 feet long. It's seven and a half feet wide. It can be manned by one or two people. But it's a big it's, you know, it's a, it's a big boat. If that was the type of boat that Peter used, I applied those measurements to that formula, and it came up to, I think it was, it was 2,050 pounds of fish. How much is 2,000 pounds? That's a ton. I've, I fish. I've filled ice chests. But not a 27-foot long, 7.5-foot wine ice chest. So they keep pulling fish out of this net with the tear in it. The net will fill the boat. But now everything in that net is in the boat. So they beckon to their partners, James and John, to come. They were in a fishing business. It was their business. It was a fishing syndicate. So then they came with their boat. So if it's the same size, I don't know. They had another ton of fish come out to fill that boat. Two tons of fish. Two tons of fish. Why would God do that? That seems so wasteful. Preachers used to tell me God never wastes anything. You're crazy. The way we look at it, he, he, he's doing things that are so unnecessary all the time. And if you'll experience the love of God, if you really let him come in and love you, if you cast down those barriers, you'll be filled with the fullness of God, verse 20. And then you'll understand this. Verse 20, Galatians, uh, I mean, Ephesians 3. And unto him, and unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that you ask or think, According to the power that's working inside of you. The Greek words hupur et parisos means God is able to do super abundantly beyond your wildest imagination. To the point of being totally ridiculous. 
so out of the ordinary that you're going to put your hand on your head and say, this makes my head dizzy. This blessing is so much, it's so large. And I'm here to tell you, that is the reality if you'll open up your heart and receive it from God. That's what he wants to do for you. Why? Because the Bible says the Father's good pleasure is to give you the kingdom. It makes him feel good. Just like an earthly father who feels good about helping his sons and daughters. And like if there's a rip between the relationship of the father and the children, it hurts the father. If the daughters and sons won't take his advice, won't take his money, won't take his blessing. Now, I understand if the father's got ult, 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 you know, bad motives and reasoning, I understand not to. But it just put, put it into earthly sense. Because how much more is God? It breaks the father's heart. If he can't get blessings to you. What did Malachi 3 say? You have robbed me in tithes and offerings. They said, where were you? How do we rob you in tithes and offerings? Let me ask you this. Does God need money? Does God need money? All right. Let's say it's an agricultural society. You're bringing chickens and pigs. Does God need pigs and chickens? So how do we rob God? He can manufacture gold. He could turn this thing into gold in a second. What have you robbed God from? The pleasure. The enjoyment. Why? Because when you don't tithe and give when God tells you to give, if you get stingy, now you violated the covenant and he's obligated by his word. He can't bless you. His, his hands are tied, proverbially. Per- proverbially. I didn't have any coffee this morning. <laughs> I just read my Kmart Bible in preparation. (laughs) We tie God's hands when we don't do what we know God wants us to do. It's not that he can't. It's that we've tied his hands. He doesn't need your money. He won't go broke. He says, but if you'll put me to test, put me to the test. I can't tell you how many times. Now, I wasn't testing him, but I was putting him to the test. He said, do this. How do you want me to do it? Do it this way. Okay, I'm doing it. People, this is what we're doing. Six months later, do this. You sure? Yeah, do this. Okay, how do you want me to do it? Okay, people, we're doing this. It's going to happen just like this. Time and time again for 30 years. Well, heck, since I was born again 48, 49 years ago, it was 1972, whatever that works to do, said 47. Prove me now in this. If I'll not open the windows of heaven. The last time he opened those things that flooded the whole earth. That's abundance. And I'll pour out a barakah, the blessing of Abraham. Look that word up. It goes right back to Genesis 12. I will pour what I made Abraham. I'm going to make you. What I did for Abraham, I'm going to do for you. That's why Paul wrote in Galatians chapter 3 that Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law so that we could receive the blessing of Abraham. Baraka. And you read the blessing of Abraham in Genesis 12 too. He says, I will bless you. Barak, it's a verb. Only God can do it. God was doing the blessing. I will bless you. Barak, that's my job, God's saying, to bless you. Make your name famous, make your name great, and you shall be a baraka, a blessing. That's a noun. That's not a verb. There's no action to it. It's a state of being. (laughs) Let me say that again. I know it's Sunday morning. I know I'm throwing a lot at you, but that's okay. You can handle it. Baraka. Yeah, that's all you got to know. Is that it? Baraka. I received the baraka. God says, I will bless you. It's a verb. Barak. A verb is action. There has to be someone doing the action and someone receiving the action. God's doing that action. And he said, Abraham, I'll make you a baraka. That's not a verb. That's a noun. That's a state. That's a thing. In the human uh, uh, situation, it's a state of being. I will make you a blessing. Abraham was a blessing every place he went. And that's what Wanda and I want to do, everything that we do. Is be a blessing, be a source of blessing every place that we go. Every place that we go. We want to be blessing. We're not trying to receive or get anymore. We want to be a blessing in everything that we know. Well, that's what he says he'll pour out into you in Malachi 3. Okay, what time is it? I've covered so much ground. And I haven't even... 
get started. <laughs> I'll skip over that one. What eye has not seen or ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man, the things that God's prepared. You haven't seen it yet, what he's fixed to do. You haven't heard yet what he's about to do. The things he's about to do is going to blow your mind. Let me, let me just jump over several things here and go to, go to the book of Amos chapter 9. Amos 9.13. I won't even turn to it. I'll just read the little thing here. In the message translation, it says, Things are going to begin to happen so fast your head is going to swim. I'm not going to build it up. I'm just going to go ahead and lay it out there. Things are going to begin to happen so fast your head's going to swim. One thing fast on the heels of the other. You won't be able to keep up. I said you won't be able to keep up. Somebody should get excited about that. You won't even be able to keep up. Everything will be happening at once. Everywhere you look, blessings. Everywhere you look, blessings. Lift your hands and say, every place I look, I'm going to see blessings. Blessings, blessings, blessings. Blessings like wine pouring off mountains and hills. The, the uh, King James says that there's going to be so much new wine coming from the mountains that it's going to obliterate the hills. Wine doesn't grow up in a mountain. Some wine, some grapes in France and Italy and Argentina will grow up about 2,000 feet. But you get to what a mountain is, the, the grapes get smaller, the clusters get smaller, and the tannins increase, and it ain't good stuff. Well, what God's going to do is good stuff. Yeah. It's new wine. The new wine, in other words, settle down now. Settle down. <laughs> this new wine God's about to pour out is going to come from dormant, barren places in your life. <laughs> places that you weren't supposed to be prosperous in. Things weren't supposed to change. The odds were against you. That's where God's fixing to show up. Somebody praise God. Hallelujah. I release that into this body of believers right now. I release it in the name of Jesus Christ. John chapter 2. Let's, let's look at what this blessed looks like. The third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee and Jesus and his mother and the disciples went with him. They went to the wedding. And when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus turned to him and said, they have no wine. And listen to what Jesus said to, the mom, to his mom. Woman, what have I to do with you? My hour has not yet come. Passion translation says it this way. My dear one, don't you understand that if I do this, it won't change anything for you, but it will change everything for me. For my hour of unveiling my power has not yet come. My hour has not yet come. The Bible says that Jesus only does, only did what he saw God the Father do. Amen? Doesn't the Bible say Jesus only spoke what he heard the Father say? Jesus did not see God doing that right then at that hour. <clears throat> Jesus didn't hear the Father saying it right then at that hour. But Mary did. <laughs> yes! She probably had a Kmart Bible under her arm too when she did it. Remember the woman with the issue of blood? Who touched me? What do you mean, who touched you? Everybody's the throngs thronging you. That's what throngs do. They throng people. He looked around about and she said, I did. Jesus did not initiate that. 
The woman with the issue of blood did. Some of you are going to get this later on today. It's going to change your life. It changed my life. If you abide in me and my words take up root and abide in you, then you'll ask what you will. You'll ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you herein. This is where God receives glory. Now you're going, there's a place in God where if you'll spend the time. Now, I'm not talking about coming to church. I'm talking about daily. Abiding in his word, meditating in his word. And what comes when you meditate in the word? There you go. And his words abide in you. 24-7. 24-7. There's a place where your will becomes so woven together with his will. They're the same thing. To where God's influence on you is stronger than the natural world's influence. Than stronger than, than the carnal influence or the soulish influence. There's a place in God. Now, I've been in that place from time to time. I've yet to stay in that place. So I've got something to look forward to. And this is where God receives glory. God does not receive glory when you can't pay your bills. You, you, you tell everybody you're a Christian filled with the Holy Ghost, go to this church, and your car is falling apart. He receives no glory just like an earthly father wouldn't. The last thing my mother would say to me as I was growing up in elementary and junior high school is, have you put on some clean underwear? <laughs> have you put on some clean underwear? One day I finally asked you, why are you so worried about my boxer shorts? Well, because if they have to take you to the hospital and cut your pants off, I want them to understand your mother gives you clean underwear. <laughs> Can I get an amen? amen? Well, God cares more than my mom. And he cares more than just about your underwear. There's a place. Now, before I go through the details of the story, which I will do quickly, I won't, I won't take a long time, I want to read the conclusion. Because God is the Alpha and the Omega. Let's go to the Omega in verse 11. This explains the purpose of this miracle. This is, the, this is what God wanted to achieve, what Mary saw. And then Jesus, after he thought about it for a few moments, then he saw it. This beginning of miracles, that means the very first one. He didn't do any miracles when he was a teenager like all the false things say. This was the very first miracle. Beginning of miracles Jesus did in Galilee. Why did he do it? To manifest forth his glory. And his disciples believed in him. The purpose of this miracle, the reason that this particular miracle took place of multiplying water to wine was to manifest, manifest Jesus' glory. The word manifest, fenuro, means to make manifest, to make visible or known what has previously been hidden or unknown. The word glory, doxa, According, and you, I could talk a month of Sundays just on that word because there's so many different elements to glory. But in Vine's Expository Dictionary, it says, that which represents the nature and acts of God in self-manifestation. He did this miracle to be a clear represent, representation of his nature. How we can expect him to react and behave. What he essentially is and does... This miracle is to set forth what he essentially is and what he essentially does. Not what we think, but what, from his point of view, as exhibited in whatever way he reveals himself. It is the essence and the essential qualities that determine his character and his personality. We have dumbed God down to our level of thinking so much, we believe that he is limited. Nudge your neighbor and say, man, he sure got your number. He's talking right to you. We have dumbed God down so much in our mind that when the word comes, we cut off the faith. And we say, we can't do that. We say, that never happened to me. can never happen to me. 
And so we're hung by our tongue. We've dumbed God down. And so God, that's why part of the reason the Bible is written, instead of being handed down from mouth to mouth traditionally, the way it was before, is so that we could read it and look at it and study it and get a good idea of what was going on and understand the meaning of it, the extravagance of God's nature. The, there's no other word for it. But the absolute extravagance of, of God's nature. Amen. Then Mary turned to the servants, instead of feeling rejected, instead of feeling like she failed, instead of feeling like God didn't listen to her prayers, she just walked away from him, turned to the servants, and said the last recorded words in the Bible of Mary. Now, she said more words, but the last recorded words are, do, are these right here. Whatsoever he tells you to do, do it. If there's anything you get out of this, that's it. Whatever he tells you to do, do it. Whatever he tells you to do, do it. So after the thing got on Jesus, he realized this was his hour. He told the servants there were six water pots. The Amplified says 20 to 30 gallons each. Other places say it's so many as three firkins, which is about 20, 27 uh, uh, gallons. So I did the numbers doing 30 gallons. We'll cut it in half later and see if you're still impressed. So I looked up, so they, so, so they so filled the water pots, six water pots, 30 gallons each. Jesus said, now take, obey it, take some water, bring it to the governor of the feast. He did. At somewhere at that point, the water turned to wine. And the governor said, usually you put the best wine out first and the cheap wine, everyone's drunk. So they're all drunk. They're intoxicated. You look it up in the Greek, they're intoxicated. And that's when he did the miracle. So a bunch of drunks. <laughs> not one record that one drunk was asking for more wine. And they were already drunk, so it's really not needed. Is when God does with that what he did. No one was saved. Listen to me. No one was saved. No one rededicated their life. No devils were cast out. No one was raised from the dead. No one was healed. The first miracle that the creator of the universe chose out of all, we, I would have raised the dead. <laughs> well, what would you have done? Walked on water? I mean, I don't know. The, the first miracle that was designed to, to, to reveal what has not been known, to show what we haven't seen, to show a new thing in the earth today that we've not seen before is this miracle that there was no need and it wasn't necessary. So it was more than needed. It was overflowing. It was, un it was superfluous. It wasn't needed. Why? Why? Why did he do that? Because that's what he's trying to make the point to get us to see. He quit dumbing him down Amen. to your way of thinking. Amen. Ask him to lift your thinking up to the way yeah. he thinks. Yeah. My ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. Amen. So I am going to say, give me your ways and thoughts. Fill my mind. Let me see the way you see. So you multiply 750 milliliters in a bottle of wine. You divide that by, multiply that, shake it around, shake it and bake it. It turns out to 905 bottles of wine. Let me say that again. 905 bottles of wine. 905 bottles of wine. You know, I, I, I drink wine with, with, with a meal. I don't think I've drunk 900 bottles my entire life. And I'm going to be 70 years old in a few months. Someone say 905 bottles. So the best wine. Well, what's the best wine? Well, we're not talking about what my day, Boone's Farm, was 29 cents. So we're not talking about Boone's Farm. You remember that? Muscatel? Huh? So what would be good wine to you? $100, $200, $500? I've, I've seen $1,200 bottles of wine. I've heard Bill Johnson talk about uh, $10,000 bottles of wine. But if you just put $100 on the bottle, which isn't the best wine, that's $90,000 as a wedding gift. Because the governor went to the groom and said, you put forth the best wine. So this wine is your wine. And what did they do with that wine? You think they sat there and drank it till next week? They sold it. What did Peter do with those fish? He sold them. Why would God 
do this. No one saved, no one healed, no one delivered. Why would he do that? To blow your mind. Here's the question. Will you allow your mind to be blowed? Or you, will you sit there and say, well, bless God, I don't know who he is. He's from Texas. Everybody thinks everything's big in Texas. That's just the way they're born. Well, I was born in Louisiana. I'm a Cajun. And we eat bugs that come out of the ditch. So there you go. We cook them things. We like them. The question is, will you allow your mind to be blowed? Or are you going to hold on to your entrenched to your old way of thinking? Bless God. I'm going to die and I'm going to be sick and I'm going to be poor. And don't you try to talk me out of it, Sonny. All right. Have it your way. Have it your way. I was writing this. I'm writing this book on how to live in the excesses of God, renewing our minds to begin to see a whole different and all these stories. And as I was writing, I began to prophesy as I'm typing. And here's what God said. You don't know me. You only think that you know me. You only recognize one side of my nature in the old covenant. But in the new, I'm going to mess up your theology and show you a side of my nature that is so extravagant and so exorbitant to your unrenewed mind that it's going to make your head swim. Yes, you'll see people healed in signs and wonders, but know this. I am always focused on supplying you, my child, with everything you need. No matter how frivolous or trivial it appears to others, it's important to me because I love you. <laughs> Through these fingers, he I started praying for parking places back in the 70s. I got them. I was an outside salesman selling. Uh, we represented Craig Car Stereo, so we sold car stereos and Jensen speakers and JVC Quadraphonic to southeast Texas and southern Louisiana. And so I called on all these customers in the 70s because cars didn't come with uh, they came with radios. They didn't come with, you know, cloud and Wi-Fi and all that. So if you wanted your own music system, you had to put it in. So the, so the second, the, uh, the side uh, deal business became very, very successful. And I became very successful and, 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 you know, made a lot of money. And like you said, the guy offered to sell me the company after about two, two and a half years. And that's why I had to decide whether to go in the ministry or buy the company. <clears throat> and so my best customers, I call them every two weeks and, um, uh, I had a Vista, Oldsmobile Vista Cruiser station wagon, and I would load it up, put the back seat down, load it up, and I'd bring the, the fast-moving products. As we had this, before real-time inventory was invented, I invented it, a Cajun invented it in Louisiana. It was me. So that they always, they didn't have a stock. They, we, I had it all laid out, little spreadsheets that I did, you know, and this month you're going to need this many, and this month you're going to need this many. And this is a new product. I feel that this is the number. And so it, the numbers were accurate because it was the Holy Ghost doing it through me. It was all the Holy Ghost, because remember, in my glove compartment of my Vista Cruiser station wagon is that Kmart Bible. Don't forget that. <laughs> and so I load it up. I'm on my way to Beaumont, Texas, and I, and I get just out of the city limits, and I look. There's a big hole in the back where there were boxes, brand new car stereos and speakers, brand new, still in the manufacturer's box, brand new. Pulled over, checked it. Sure enough, someone had broken in and stolen the equipment. So I drove back to the office. Telling them my sad story in my office, and the bosses were there, and most of the employees were gathered around. I was saying someone broke in, stole it. I'm so sorry. I, I don't know what I could have done any different, but you know, I'm sure your insurance will cover it. And Chester looked at me and said, <laughs> Insurance? No, make an inventory and write me a check for whatever you owe me. Thousands of dollars. Right then, now this was, um, I think, 75. Maybe 76, you know, started the church in 76, I'm pretty sure. So somewhere around 75, okay? 
So I'm 27 years old, I think, or 26 years old. I don't know that much. What I know now, I understand. It was the gift of faith and the gift of prophecy that came on me in that office, in that ugly green painted office with all these people standing around. And the anger rose up inside of me. And it just rose up like a cyclone. And I opened my mouth and I said, no, I'm not. Because the person that stole this brand new car stereos and speakers is going to turn himself in and give it all back. And they, they looked at me. <laughs> so I repeated it. I said, no, I'm not. Because the guy that stole this is going to turn himself in and give every single thing back. I'm not going to pay you a dime. And then I stuck a, in the name of Jesus on it. Yes. Now, I wasn't speaking from my mind. This was the gift of the spirit of faith. I couldn't doubt if you held a gun to my head. And I was prophesying what was fixing to happen. I turned on my heels and walked out and got in my car and I drove down a couple blocks and I came to a red light and I pulled up the red light and stopped. And about then, that gift of faith lifted right off of me. <laughs> and I'm alone in that car. I said, oh God, what did I, did you hear what I said? Can you believe I'm that dumb to say something like that? These are brand new car stereos, and I'm saying he's going to give it all back. I'm so sorry I let you down. And the Spirit said to me, he said, if you'll keep your mouth shut, <laughs> it'll happen just like he said. So I went, boop. That was on a Tuesday. Wednesday, boop, except for, thank you, thank you. Thursday, boop, except for, it's coming to pass like you say. People that were, oh, oh, where are they going to turn him in? Look at you, poor Perry. Blah, 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 blah. Friday, the police calls. Three days. Resurrection. A guy came in to the police. <laughs> I don't know what she said, but it was powerful. Harabasikala. A guy came into the police department and just confessed to a crime we weren't looking him for. Do you know anything about this? He, he brought all these boxes of car stairs and speakers in and said he just stole them from your car or, you know, from your address. So we traced down and found you and called you. I said, could you say that, say that again, please? <laughs> I said, well, what made him turn himself in and not sell? Because, I mean, you could sell those things on any corner in America, you know, for $20 each. These were $100 and $200 items back in 70 whatever. It would have been easy to sell them. It would have been easy to sell them. Heck, I'd have bought half of them myself if given the chance. <laughs> He said, there were these, I can't remember if he said two or three, but there were the couple of these tall men that kept following him around. <laughs> sometimes he'd see them, sometimes it wouldn't. And he was so afraid of these tall guys standing around him, he locked the doors, closed the windows for three days. He's been holed up in his house, afraid to go out in the street. What am I telling you? I've got two boxes of Walmart Bibles I want to sell you when the service is over. <laughs> if you give God a chance and get out of your way of thinking and you get this paradigm thing changing with your thoughts in your mind, who knows what God will do in your life? Now, you won't going to replicate me. I can't replicate you. It'll be unique too, but it'll be powerful. It'll be more than you can think of. And if 905 bottles is too much, if I exaggerated because I'm a preacher, let's cut it in half. Let's say it was only 452 and a half bottles of wine. It's still over 400 bottles of wine. Still over forty thousand dollars at a hundred dollar evaluation, and that ain't the best wine. We're talking a thousand dollars a bottle, eight hundred dollars a bottle. Imagine, I don't know, but I can't multiply it in my head, so I'm gonna skip on like I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Have you ever given a forty thousand dollar gift to anybody in a wedding? Do you want to? Yes. It's the only reason I can think of for him doing that. He's trying, he wants to blow our mind. Yeah. Unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that you ask or think, it's according to the power 
that's working in you. The word there, according to, is the Greek, or, uh, it's either the noun or the verb, I can't remember, energia or energio, and it means to ener energize, it means to activate. Dunamis is the word translated healing virtue that came out of Christ. You should receive power after the Holy Ghost. Same word. So it's miraculous power. That's what Strong says. It's miraculous power. He is able to do according to how much of that anointing you are energizing in your life. You de-energize it with negative thinking and negative speaking and being disobedient. Sin will negate it. If you talk negative, if you think negative... Jesus said, Whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed, be thou cast, and he shall doubt and suffer, he believes the things he's come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. If you look the words up saying three times, the things you're going to have isn't the faith command. The things you're going to have is Lego, everything you're saying. If, if, you, if you don't have 10 years of saying in front of your faith command, I don't know, other than the gift of the Spirit, if anything's going to happen. But if you've got years of speaking what God's word speaks and all things are possible, now there's weight to that faith command. You see what I'm saying? You can't just generate a faith command and think something's going to happen. How do you know that? Because I tried it. If it's you, make that tree fall down. What'd that tree do? I don't know. I drove on by. I'm still standing when I drove by. It's a lifestyle. You've got to leave your country and leave your father's house, not because they aren't good people, but because you can't learn this new thing that he's teaching you. You can't put new wine in old wineskins because the fermentation process this new wine's going to do, the fermentation, the bubbling, and the blah, 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 that this new wine's going to do inside of you will rip the old skin apart and you'll go crazy because you're the wineskin. You need a new wineskin, a new paradigm, a new way of thinking, a new way of believing, a new way of acting. And all things are possible.